Okay, this is uh, Rebecca Tushnet. We're gonna do the traditional uh, waiting uh, a couple minutes to let everyone uh, filter in uh, and then get started uh, and uh, end on time. Great, so uh, I wanna thank everyone for coming um, and note that uh, this will be recorded uh, so that people can access it later. Um, and uh, just so you know, uh, so participants will not be uh, re recorded, uh, but uh, if you have a question, uh, you can share it and uh, we, will, we will address it. Um, so uh, my name is Rebecca Tushnet, and uh, I am here to facilitate a conversation with people who've been successful uh, in uh, incorporating online learning into their teaching. Um, and the impetus behind this uh, series is that too often uh, we are expected to learn to teach by osmosis. And of course, as we know with our students, uh, you know, some people can be successful uh, learning from osmosis, but we set more people up for success uh, when we are as explicit as possible about what we want uh, and what constitutes uh, a, a successful contribution. And that's true for us as teachers as it is for, uh, for our students. So um, with that in mind, uh, I, I hope we can hear from people about what's worked and people can get ideas about what might work for them. So we're just going to start uh, in alphabetical order um, with Jessica Erickson from the University of Richmond, um, and, uh, and I believe she has a presentation about various tools that she uses um, to, to help with engagement. So Jessica, uh, I can hand it over to you. All right. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Jessica from the University of Richmond. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here simply because I want to be able to show you some screenshots of some things that I did when the whole world changed a few years ago and what we might take with us. So I've titled this presentation Googling Student Engagement, not because I am a fan or, or anything of Google, but because there were some specific tools that I used that I thought helped me engage our students. And I'll confess off the bat that I was a big skeptic of using a lot of technology in my classes before the pandemic. Um, and in fact, the example I sometimes use is that a few months before the pandemic, my teenage daughter came to my class for the very first time. So she sat through an entire business associations class. And at the end of the class, I said, so what do you think? And I was so excited to hear her like rave about just what a great teacher I was. And in fact, she said to me, she said, it's so cool how they can do anything they want in class. And I said, wait a minute, like what? And mind you, she was sitting in the very back of the classroom looking at the front of all the students' computers. And she said, they can do anything they want, like Facebook. And so that soured me on how students would engage with technology that I needed to keep them off the screens, off the tech. And then, of course, a few months later, the pandemic hit and we were all on screens and there was nothing I could do about it. So what I decided to do was to embrace the tech, use the tech to engage our students. So I'm going to talk very quickly about four tools that I used. Again, it's going to be quick. Four tools I used to engage students in and outside of the classroom. The first one is Google Docs, and I know you're probably all familiar with Google Docs. When the pandemic hit, we were all supposed to use Google Docs collaboratively. Wouldn't that be great? I didn't use them that way. Instead, what I did was that I tried to use Google Docs as a way to connect with my students outside of the classroom. Because I don't know about you, but I've had that experience where I assign reading, students have come in, and they've kind of skimmed the reading, but they don't really know it well enough. And so now we're all, I'm spending my class time basically reviewing the basics of the reading because they didn't read it well enough because there was no real need for them to do so, was at least you know my fear. So what I did 
was I put in my syllabus, you can see here all the way over there, um, Google Doc assignments for every single class. So here's just one example, asking the students to write in a Google Doc that was just for them that they shared with me. So the only people who could see their Google Doc was them and me. And there were just little assignments for every single day. And what I tell them is, I just want a few sentences, that's it, right? And, and then I would often include just for fun questions, ways that I could get to know them as people. I taught 100 students that fall of 2020. I often have big classes. This was a great way just to have some fun with them. And here's just a sample student answer. Again, just a few sentences. There's the fun fact that includes their high school. Um, but the idea was that then before class, before they ever came in, I could see whether the students understood the basic idea. If it looked like everybody was confused about the basics, then I knew I had to go back and cover that in a little more detail. If it seemed like they were okay with the basics, then I could gauge my class a little, little bit higher level. And it allowed me to get to know them as people. I had a whole variety of them. Most of them were on Google Docs. I actually did some through Flipgrid. Um, and I could incorporate them on anything. This is my civil procedure class, anything that we were covering. I also use the Google Docs here, you can see the one in blue, to cover metacognition, get students to really reflect on their learning, think about what they needed to do to be successful in the class. And you may think to yourself, wow, 100 students, each one has a Google Doc, you have to go through each one of them. It turns out that Google Docs are really easy that way. I would just create a folder, here's the folder from that fall, and you can literally just click through them. Once in a while, I'd make little comments. I tried to make little comments uh, every, every couple of weeks on a student's Google Doc, but usually it was just me looking at it so that they knew that I was there. All right, so that's outside of class, but then inside of class. And inside of class, we were on Zoom, right? And we had to think about how to engage our students. So what did I use there? Well, Google Timers is the first thing I'm gonna tell you about. So when I was at the AALS New Law Teachers Conference many, many years ago, I remember a dean telling us that we should never talk in class for more than 10 or 15 minutes before getting the students engaged in some way. And I remember thinking, yeah, that sounds great. I'm gonna to try to do that. And the reality was I never did, right? Because I had so much material to cover and my enthusiasm in the class, I felt like that was enough. I engaged them, but not every 10 to 15 minutes. On Zoom, I felt like I didn't have a choice. I had to, on Zoom, be a better teacher than I was in person because I had to hold their attention. So I would literally just have a 10 minute timer sitting on one of my many monitors that it surrounded me as I taught, a 10 minute timer. And my goal was to get them doing something at the end of the timer. So I wouldn't let that timer go for, you know, end with much time after it before I was trying to get them engaged. It was a reminder to me to stop talking. I actually still do this. I literally bring my phone into class and I just set a timer. Now I set it for 15 minutes because, well, I can. But I try again to keep it moving. All right, Google Forms. I know that we, a lot of us use Poll Everywhere and some of those sort of clicker technologies. I love those. But I realized that I wanted to get them sharing deeper thoughts, not just check, checking A, B, C, or D. I wanted their longer analysis, not five paragraphs, but I wanted them to have to articulate things at various points through the classes. So this is my Blackboard page for class. You can see there that I have just links that sit in my Blackboard page, link to question one, link to question two. And the great thing is that from class to class, I could change question one and question two. Links were always the same, questions varied every class. So for example, if I told the students, all right, go ahead to the link for question one, and they could bookmark it because it was always the same, and they might see why was the process in Van Gorkum grossly negligent? Again, I didn't want much, but a few sentences where they had to stop and explain the case to me. And in real time, I could see their answers. Here's what some of them said during that class. It was great because now instead of just asking one student the question, I could ask all hundred of them the question and see in real time where they were, pull out individual student answers. I still use this today. That Blackboard page I just showed you, that was my one from last semester. I love it. 
And I also would do something similar at the end of the class. Here's my, what I call my civil procedure compass, the QR code, or they could use the bit.ly. It doesn't really matter. But when you go there, it was just at the end of class to get them again, metacognition, to get them to reflect what were some takeaways. And then do you have any questions from today's class? Is there anything else that I should know? Just again, a way to check in with them and make sure that we were all on the same page. Final Google searches, and here I'm being a little bit loose with Google. They, we did searches in other ways as well. But I found that I was defaulting to small little engagement opportunities, like the ones I've just showed you, two or three minutes, just type out a few sentences. And that I wanted them, especially on Zoom, but candidly still, now that we're all back in person, to have some opportunities to go deeper. So I set a goal for myself that at least once every class, I would have the students research new information relevant to what we were learning. I'm gonna show you just two quick examples from my class. The first one, does Capital One have a staggered board? So if we're talking about board structure, I would tell the students, all right, 20 minutes. I want you to find Capital One Certificate of Corporation and then look through it, figuring out its board structure. Another example, Ooh, well, formatting's a little off here, but oh well. Does Virginia handle exculpation differently than Delaware? And again, spend the next 20 minutes finding Virginia's exculpation statute. I didn't assign it, you need to find it, and comparing it to Delaware's statute. Now, I will tell you that these times gave me heartburn because it was 20 minutes out of a 100 minute class. I was losing so much, I felt like. But those 20 minutes, it turns out, got the ideas in their head better than anything I could have done in those 20 minutes. It cemented the ideas much better than the basic form of teaching that I had done before. Again, this is something that I have flipped even now that we are both in person. All right, so Re Rebecca and Leah asked me to share one idea. Instead, I shared four. But the idea here is using some of the tech tools while Zoom and keeping them in our current classes. Happy to talk, but otherwise, I'm going to turn it over to Michael. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, th this was fantastic. I already have a bunch of questions. I think they will be relevant to everyone, though. So um, let's let's go uh, to Michael, who is the founding director of the Sports and Entertainment Law Institute at the University of New Hampshire School of Law. Um, and uh, he, he has experienced launching a successful online certificate program. Um, so hopefully we will learn also from him. Well, thank you very much, Rebecca. Thank you, uh, Jessica and Leah. I'm honored to be part of this panel and to be included in the discussion. I'm going to talk about a program, an online program in sports betting law that we launched at UNH Law right after the Supreme Court ruled in 2018 that the federal ban on sports betting, specifically a ban that prevented states from licensing sports betting operations, was unconstitutional. When that happened, it created real chaos in the sports industry because people wondered, well, what's gonna happen next? Can I go now bet on sports, which previously was illegal, in some cases criminal to even do it. And it created an opportunity for our school to kind of jump first into that space. And I had spoken with a number of attorneys, but particularly Daniel Wallach, who is a national expert on sports betting law. And we came up with an idea that was to build a program quickly. And quickly is really important because states were gonna to have to decide whether to legalize sports betting. And, and that question has a number of sub questions. For instance, is it legalizing sports betting in general? Is it which sports? Is it pro sports and college sports? Is it online betting? Does a company have to have a physical facility in a state to operate there or can it just exist online? So these are all real important questions. And we developed a program, a five course program that offered industry leaders delivering lectures on these issues. Five of the core, of the five courses, one was really a basic intro to sports betting law course. And from that, we created a law school JD section for that course. So this was before the pandemic, I should know. This was pre-pandemic. And it was very successful. The launch, we, we had a number of people interested in this program, figuring out 
the price point was important. We landed on about $7,000, which provided a lot of content and was also relatively affordable because many of the people that pursued this were attorneys who were trying to expand their skill set. A lot of attorneys thought, I would love to be an expert in sports betting law, given that states are now looking at legalizing it, really sort of a first mover in that space. And others included compliance officers at universities in their athletic departments. How will this affect college sports that people can bet on sports? We had people from the gaming industry, from casinos, uh, from tribes also uh, joined because of tribal gaming opportunities. It was really a, a diverse group of people that signed up and we were floored by the turnout. And it really was a great way of kind of entering that space. But, but there are challenges with any online program, uh, one of which is keeping the material contemporary. So we built out, we had about 40 people participate in speaking uh, in, in these courses. And that's a lot of people to provide content. And it also means that in a year or two, some of that content can become outdated, how to replace it in a way that's cost effective. And then there's, of course, the monitoring or teaching of an online course. Uh, like everyone else, I have a normal course load. So it isn't as if I can sort of drop my regular stuff to, to do all online teaching. So that had to be managed in terms of having individuals who could monitor the courses. And we used adjuncts for that, uh, partly because there are very few people who really knew the underlying area of law, such as data issues in terms of gaming, who owns the data? Well, there aren't that many people that really can speak uh, in an authoritative way on that. So we had a limited pool of teachers, adjuncts. And I think as we all know with adjuncts, adjuncts are busy and some do an excellent job of monitoring content. Others need to be pushed along and others are excited to do it and then realize how much work it is. And then they're, they're not always available. So I it turned out I had to kind of fill some gaps, which is fine, but I, I also want to be sort of candid about programs like this, where there are some great things about it, but they also have to be managed in a way that's efficient for, for all involved. And it's a program that is also one that we have to think about how long does it last? Because sports betting law has shifted a lot over the last four plus years. And more and more states have legalized it. Massachusetts is one of the, the latest states to legalize it, though they haven't yet implemented it. But it, it means that some of the content that was relevant in 2018 isn't so relevant in 2023. So maybe a smaller program, maybe one that's more focused on how sports leagues are using that content, how they're licensing it, who owns the data, the fact that there are international issues involved as well in terms of gaming companies from Europe using the data in the US. Uh, there's debates in the United Kingdom about who controls the data. Can you have what are called data scouts, people showing up at games and getting the scores quickly and transmitting them uh, when, there's, when that technically violates a license that another company has? In the US, we would say there's a First Amendment right. In Europe, it's a, it's a little bit more tricky. So some really interesting issues continue to exist that are worth exploring, but I think in any online program, particularly one that's focused on an emerging space, it's important to think about how to pivot in a way that's timely and when to sunset it in a way that makes sense for all involved, because they can be very productive financially and they can provide a resource that isn't available generally but it's also one where the runway may, may end at some point. Uh, in addition to the sports betting program, we also were the first school to launch a course on name, image, and likeness. Name, image, and likeness is, of course, a topic that's gotten a lot of attention in recent years. It involves the NCAA allowing college athletes to use a right they already have, the right of publicity, to make money through endorsement deals, through social media influencing. And that was something that the NCAA has long resisted, it's something that I've worked on in my career uh, with Ed O'Bannon, the former NBA player who sued the NCAA. And finally, in 2020, the NCAA allowed it in part because they were, were really more than in part because states had passed laws saying it's now illegal for the NCAA and schools to deny college athletes a right. Again, they already have 
uh, to, to make money. So uh, the thinking then is, okay, well, now that the NCAA allows it, how is that space? There's now a vacuum. Who's going to make money in that space? Whose rights are going to be protected? So we created an NIL course uh, that got a lot of interest in, and that was also online. And again, now, three years later, maybe that's not so fresh because now NIL is more part of the conversation. The knowledge is more known. Now the issues maybe are less legal, more business oriented. So pivoting into that direction is also important. And I would say that with online programs, understanding the student is really crucial. And by that, I, I mentioned earlier, attorneys as a student are going to be different than a JD student. Their interests are very different. Their time is different. And how they're assessed is important as well. They want to get feedback in ways that a JD student might not, but they also want some recognition that some weeks they're going to be busy and they may not have the same bandwidth to provide as thoughtful of, of an answer as they would like. So understanding the audience uh, and being sort in viewing the student more as a partner. I think with law students, JD students, we tend to, they're students and we're the professor. With students who are really continuing their education and learning a skill set, they, they're a little bit, I would say they're more, more equal and they're more of a customer than necessarily a student. They're really doing it for a specific purpose in mind, which is to augment their skill set and be able to deliver services to clients that they otherwise wouldn't be able to, or in the context of, say, somebody that works at a casino, they may not even be a lawyer. They just want to know this area of law because it pertains to what they're working on. And figuring out the right strategy with each student, I think, is important. And that has to be built into building any sort of online program. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I know we'll have opportunities to talk more, but I hope that's a helpful overview. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and I also have a ton of questions for you, but um, uh, let's go to Leah Plunkett, the inaugural Assistant Dean for Learning Experience and Technology and the Meyer Research Lecturer on Law at Harvard. Uh, she heads our Learning Experience and Technology team. Um, and so uh, Leah, please take it away. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and a shout out to my wonderful LXT colleague who's in the background of this webinar, keeping us all moving along. So I wanted to talk about something that I really did not do. Maybe I did it once before the pandemic, but I did not do it regularly until the pandemic. And I have loved it so much that I've kept it up. And that is actually a little bit of a version of what we're doing today, remote guest speakers. Pre-pandemic, I would bring guest speakers into my brick and mortar classroom, and I would bring in guest speakers who were local or at most regional, an hour or less away. And that was wonderful. I was really fortunate. I was actually at University of New Hampshire, Franklin Pierce School of Law at that time. Um, wonderful to see my, my former wonderful colleague, uh, still wonderful person, but former colleague, Mike McCann, on here today. And I was you know, teaching down the hall from him. And I would bring in experts in domains that I was teaching in who were also nearby. And many wonderful benefits of that approach. Certainly face-to-face -face creates a certain type of energy. And also, if you're thinking about a little bit of the unofficial curriculum of law schools, bringing in in-person guest speakers allows your students to meet and greet before and after during a break and maybe establish a little bit of connection or at least familiarity. So don't want to diminish at all the value of in-person expert guests, but I do want to give an enthusiastic two thumbs up to remote guest speakers. Of course, Jessica, as you were saying earlier, during the pandemic, we all started doing a lot of things out of necessity and bringing in guest speakers via Zoom or whatever video conferencing platform your school was using became a necessity when schools were operating online by emergency. I also agree with Jessica's wonderful note earlier that the importance of chunking or modularizing class instruction becomes even even more important when you are trying to hold an audience on Zoom. So if you are then bringing in a remote expert guest, you have the benefit of that additional perspective and expertise. And Mike, as you were saying, there are certain domains where practicing attorneys, practicing 
you know, other types of professionals, regulators, lawmakers, and other thought leaders may have insights and expertise that we don't have from our vantage point inside the academy. And so zooming in or remoting in somebody who can help you break up a little bit of your instructional time, and most important, give a layer of exploration and thought challenges to your students just proved to be incredible during the pandemic. And we also saw in, in the classes I was teaching that the ability to scaffold other types of more engaged exercises either before a remote guest speaker or during a remote guest speaker could also prove extremely engaging and valuable. So an example, if you know you have the senior partner from insert name here, zooming into your class, then having your students prepare ahead of time, what are the questions they are going to ask the senior partner? What might be short presentations that it would be appropriate for them to make for the senior partner? That kind of advanced preparation outside side of class can also be very engaging and generative for students. And then during class, of course, depending on the subject matter that your remote guest is instructing in, as well as your individual pedagogical goals for a class, you may want a lot of guest speaker talking like I'm doing right now. You may also want, as Rebecca will lead us into shortly, a more engaged iterative portion where your students with some guidance by you and potentially teaching fellows and other teaching team members are moving a conversation along, perhaps even doing small group breakout work. So one type of scaffolding that I found to be particularly effective was having a remote guest speaker do, as Jessica was saying, 10 to 20 minutes, give or take, of some sort of instruction or PowerPoint, and then adding in some quick breakout rooms or small group exercises for students to build upon what the remote guest speaker was saying or to reflect upon it, to respond to a prompt, and then to come back and report out on their small group engagement. And there are ways in which Zoom and other remote learning platforms can be particularly conducive, as we've all experienced many times now, uh, can be particularly conducive to that breakout work. Sending students into breakout rooms with the press of a few buttons can be a little bit easier than having them get up and move around the classroom. If nothing else, as Jessica's daughter observed, they have to stop looking at Facebook in order to get up and move around. <laughs> That's amazing, by the way, as a mom of two kids, I'm now never going to let my children visit my classroom. But if you put folks into breakout rooms, give them a prompt, keep them at, I would say, 12 minutes or less, give or take, and then zoom them back in, they can then quickly report out by using perhaps a quick slide they prepared, or if you don't want them to screen share, there are plenty of other ways for them to do it. And of course, that type of remote guest speaker scaffolded with a small group learning experience, as well as perhaps some advanced prep can be done in a brick and mortar classroom as well. I've brought that back to campus with me. I know many of my colleagues at HLS have as well. And it is continuing to prove very generative and very, very engaging. And one of the other things that students reported really enjoying about it is it allows for a range of perspectives and a range of insights that expand an already incredibly insightful and diverse set of viewpoints in a classroom. So my plug for continuing from the online by emergency time to the selectively online by opportunity is figuring out wherever you are set up in whatever law school in the country or the world, what the technology is that allows you to bring in perhaps a former law school classmate, perhaps a former colleague, perhaps somebody you've never talked to before that you would like to hear from. Certainly I have found that our colleagues in the bar and in on the bench and in all sorts of positions within the law or law adjacent fields are so excited to 
offer some time to interact with students and contribute to an educational mission. And Mike, building on one of your insights earlier, that people who are practicing in law or elsewhere are very, very busy. A remote guest speaker request is a really nice one to land in someone's inbox because you can ask for less than an hour. In some instances, I have asked for 20 minutes or a half an hour, and I know my colleagues have as well, because a little bit easier to log in for 20, 30 minutes, maybe up to an hour, than it is to take a train or a plane and get yourself to a physical campus not to knock the value of being together in person. I love welcoming folks back to Cambridge, and I hope people who are out there listening to this live or on recording who are fellow HLS alums or just HLS friends come visit us. But just to say that you can build upon the value of the in-person guest with continuing to use remote guests. And with that, Rebecca, since we are remote and I know that you have some questions and that folks watching us from around the country may as well, I should stop talking and practice what I'm preaching and turn it back to you to see how all of us coming together as remote guest experts and fellow HLS LS alums can continue to engage. Thank you all so much. So thank you. So I basically have four buckets of questions. Um, uh, so the first three are each inspired by one of the presentations and then, uh, uh, but I encourage everyone to, to weigh in. Um, so I, uh, I, I am completely convinced both in my experience and in my reading of the research about having the, uh, the kind of small questions to make sure that people are doing the reading along the way and identify where um, they're, they're not you know, telling you that they didn't understand, but they didn't understand. Um, so my question is a practical one. What's the best timing? To like, so the, the, of course the challenge is I wanna take a look at them before class starts. But uh, if I ask them to do the, too far before class starts, then th I, they won't be able to do it or they've read too far before class. So uh, I'm interested in people's experiences with, is there a sweet spot for when these things should be submitted? Um, and uh, relatedly, since they're not graded, uh, uh, what are what are the best things to do about non-participation, right? So, so what do you do when you find a student who's just not doing them? Uh, so, uh, I'd I'd love to hear um, for, from uh, Jessica or Michael or Leah about that. Well, I've done I've done pre-class assignments for years now. I used to do them solely in Blackboard through sort of multiple choice quizzes. What I called, are you smarter than a 1L? Because my view was, while our 1Ls are very smart, our 2Ls should know more about, for example, business law than our 1Ls should. So, I, so I've done those for years. The Google Docs were in a mention of COVID. So I always make them do by midnight the night before. I teach in the morning and I would try. So. I, in full candor, I've now been teaching for long enough that I feel fairly comfortable shaking things up on the fly, right? Or at least with not tons of preparation. There were days or years where I needed to be able to walk into class with everything scripted out, right? We, a lot of us who have been teaching for a while, we remember those days. Um, now I feel like as long as, if my class is at nine, as long as when I walk in at say 7.30, cause I'm gonna get there early on teaching days, as long as I walk in at 7.30, I can, you know, look over the things, make any adjustments I need to make. That is plenty of time for me. And let's be honest, our students probably aren't doing a lot of work at 7.30 in the morning. If they are, they've waited really long. In fact, I did have a fun time when one semester, I noticed that my quiz grades were pretty high um, at night and were much lower by the morning. And I realized that the students who were doing the work the night before were getting much better grades. And the so that's when I set my midnight deadline. Um, what do I do about non-compliance? Um, so I actually do grade it, but I grade it where everybody gets 100 as long as you do it. Now, what that means is, does it, does it break my curve much? No, no. But if you don't do it, yes, it does. And what that does for me is, I mean, yes, it creates that incentive to do it because I do think you'll have students who just don't do it if there's if they're if it's not graded in that way. But I think it also for me set out a very clear warning signal about which students were dropping off of my radar. So which students very early on did I need to worry about? Gee, are they engaged? Is something else going on in their lives? You know, attendance can often be that kind of canary in the coal mine for us with student issues. But I found that these could be as well. 
And so, you know, when I could just look across a grade book and say, okay, wow, you've missed the last three, then I know I might have an issue. What I do do is I tell them that I will drop the lowest four. 28 classes, I'll drop the lowest four. That way you have an interview, you have to go to your best friend's wedding, you don't feel well, no problem. I don't, you know, you don't need to tell me. I don't need to be handling everybody's request. I just drop the lowest four, it's one of your four, we're good. So that's the approach that I use. Uh, that's that's interesting to hear uh, Jessica's approach. I think that makes a lot of sense that before midnight um, as a way of kind of getting the right time. I, I use two two checkpoints during the week. One is by Wednesday at midnight, and this is a, for a weekly assignment, they have to submit an answer and it's posted in a discussion board. And then by Sunday night, there has to be a response. Every student has to respond to at least one other student. And so it really creates two points in which they're being assessed. And I do grade them, it's out of 10. And I, I give bad grades. I mean, I'll, there are some students, if, if they really make a half-hearted effort, particularly compared to other students, or if they don't respond to another student, then they're gonna lose three points for that. So then their best, the best they're gonna do is seven. And it's not a huge part of their grade, I think it's 10%. But by the end of the semester, there is some daylight between the student who's getting nines and tens and the student who missed a few weeks and kind of is slacking off or gave a half-hearted effort, it doesn't mean they're gonna get a bad grade in the course, but it does mean they're probably not gonna get an A at a minimum. And it, I think it's a way of sort of setting the tone that they're accountable. And uh, if it's an, even if it's an attorney, if an attorney reaches out to me to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't have time. I say, well, look, you're, you're, you're taking this class not for a grade, you're taking it pass fail, you're gonna pass presumably, but I have to send a message to particularly students that are taking it for a grade that you know, they're accountable. So I, I, I don't know if that's the right approach, it's the approach that I, that I use and, and has worked. I think it really depends on the course, uh, but, I, but I do grade that content. One other reflection that may prove helpful, especially for very large classes or for colleagues teaching a very large class for you know, a first prep or an early prep would be to think about whether it may be possible to have a teaching assistant or a teaching fellow, if, if you happen to have one, take an initial look and provide you an overview in whatever format is easiest for you. You may be somebody who wants an email in your inbox at you know, 7.30 in the morning. So as you're walking into campus, um, you are hopefully, you know, not dropping your coffee while you also look at your phone, but a little bit of that, you know, senior partner, you know, associate um, distribution. And of course, if you're actually grading them, Jessica, as, as you're doing, or Mike, as you're doing, of course, you need that, that faculty review oneself. But in terms of being prepared, simply Simply for the purpose of class discussion so that you are able to draw upon either things that students have been really enthusiastic about and have built upon or things that are emerging as maybe muddy points for your students that you would like to disentangle if you have a teaching team available to you that could take that first pass and give that to you in the form that's best for you at the time that's best for you it can minimize your need to go back through and do you know a a full review for the purpose of class discussion of course understanding that grading is its own animal that that we need to do ourselves so, I mean, uh, I, I have to say when Jessica was talking about, you know, at this point, you know, I've taught it long enough that I, there, there's sort of five moves that people make and, you know, right. Uh, I, I feel that very strongly. And of course, the big one of the big constraints on this is, you know, these new things take time and you have to decide to invest in them. Um, but I think I, I think we should probably emphasize that actually it does get much easier the second time, right? And so um, one thing that uh, that I've done that uh, I really uh, have benefited from, because I'm one of those people who like thought, oh, I have to write comments on every single one, right, at first. And uh, if, if you feel that way, first of all, you can get past it. But second of all, um, I now have a little file of like, here's the five things that like everybody says and like that I need to qualify or correct or whatever. And then I just paste them. 
um, it turns out it's not it, it's not that hard, especially if you find something that, uh, as as Jessica showed examples of, you can you know reuse because you're not super worried about you know plagiarism, right? Uh, um, which I don't think you have to be for things like this. Uh, but um, okay, so. Uh, uh, relatedly, um, in terms of the effort. So, um, uh, Michael, I was I was struck by your mention of updating content because things change fast. And I think um, one of the things that happened, uh, you know, as the the discussion about this reached law schools is, you know, people were very excited about the flipped classroom. But the principles of calculus don't change. So, if you record a lecture about like how to do a derivative, um, you know, that lecture can just sit there pretty much forever. So how do you, in your planning, build in time to update the stuff that supposedly like is asynchronous? So, so if you could talk about like, it, like how, how that affects your planning and, and of course, Lee and Jessica too. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. There's, there's a mix. Some of, the, some of the content has a permanence and won't need to be updated for a long time. Others are much more timely, particularly sort of industry stuff. I think that that's contingent upon how the industry is changing. That really has to be updated. And so there, there's two ways of updating, it, I would say. One is the minor tweak, which is changing the reading, which is to say, here's the lecture. This was built, the, the core content's the same, but here's a recent case that has come up that challenges the content that's presented in some way. And it can also create an opportunity for a, a a more robust discussion because it's a way of illustrating the content in a more contemporaneous example. The other is if something really is outdated, if there's a real error in it that has to be corrected, then it requires doing the video again. Now, the good news is that most people are probably keeping a transcript or at least notes of the video. So it isn't a big lift to do it again. Uh, with some tweaks to make sure the content is updated. And this is going to both uh, Leah and Jessica's comments about modulization, which is if it's a small module, it's not a big fix. Say, say it's a five minute thing, you know, just do it again. It's not like it's gonna take all day. So using modules and keeping them relatively brief, I, I think is a way of mitigating against the risk of having to change or edit stuff later on, because it's not going to be that onerous to do another five minute video. And when do you do the updating, right? So so like in the in the cycle of planning for the course. I try to do it before the course is taught, but but in a couple of cases, because of changes that occurred during the course, I had to make some pivots midway and it was unavoidable. But it was but I would also say it wasn't that hard. I think that's an important point that it wasn't as if it was a big undertaking. It was taking an existing lecture and making some changes and redoing the video. I, I, I would say, you, to the extent you can do it in advance, great. But in some cases, I mean, you know, in, in, in IP law, right? I mean, that, that's <laughs> changing by the day, right? So yeah, I, think, I think you got to be flexible to, to, to make those sort of changes. But I would stress, I don't think it's that hard or time consuming. I'll just jump in. So I've never used asynchronous videos except during COVID. And they're one thing I haven't gone back to candidly, right? So I think, you know, part of coming out of the post-COVID, if there is such a thing, period, is saying, okay, what do I want to bring and what do I not want to bring? For me, I always found that asynchronous videos took forever for me to record. Now, maybe there's just a learning curve and I never got there, but I felt like a 45-minute set of videos would take me like five hours to prepare for it. Whereas if I wanted to talk, I was just much more comfortable, you know, talking live, stumbling over my words than I was on videos. So I haven't brought that back in. And I think it's okay to say for my particular teaching style or your particular teaching style, some of it I'm going to bring, you know, keep, and some of it I'm not. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so now I have a question about um, guest speakers. Um, and uh, I have two have brought in working lawyers. It's great. Um, I uh, so I have some uh, some questions about uh, sort of who you think about. Obviously, sometimes it's who you know, but uh, you know what I've experienced is you know sometimes, uh, especially when things aren't recorded and you're very clear with students in advance, you get very raw honesty 
um, which is wonderful for the students. Um, and then sometimes you get people who are, show very polished advocacy, right? Who are very much there, you know, to advocate for their clients. Um, and uh, I'm just interested in, you know, what what you uh, what you can do, right? Uh, to set expectations around that. Um, I, I'm also influenced in this by a misstep that I made uh, when I brought someone in. Um, I had a student who was a fantastic, passionate student, um, but you know, read the like pr preparatory uh, materials and got really into the other side and did a bunch of research of her own and like emailed the other side's counsel. And uh, I realized I had wrongly, you know, uh, not set expectations about that. So I'm sort of interested in any of your thoughts about selection and preparing students for it. And like, uh, you know, uh, do you have an explicit list of things that you send around? Should you? And, and so on. So, uh, I don't know, Leah, you might have. Yeah, I'd love to start and then, and then welcome my, my co-panelists. I think that as it, it is really important, as you were saying, Rebecca, to try to have a sense ahead of time. And we, we can't always know, right, if someone is going to come in as a guest expert and speak with a lot of off the record candor versus somebody who's going to come in and deliver sort of a media prepped pitch. To the extent we can know, we can think about whether or not we might want to pair a guest speaker with another guest speaker. I, I haven't done this personally, but I know folks who have and have had it be extremely successful. If you have advocates on either side of an issue, for instance, come together, or if you have people who may not be sort of on opposite sides of an issue, but may see different perspectives on it, having a remote guest speaker panel can prove quite effective and can be a way of avoiding a conversation going very much in one direction, in which point you may be sort of backed into the, the corner a little bit as the instructor thinking, how do I make sure that on the fly I adjust and frame this, perhaps even once the guest speaker has gone, so that students know that they're hearing one side of an issue. And I'm, I'm confident that all of us in front of a classroom would be able to, to quickly pivot and say, you know, thank you so much, so-and-so, and a -so, big round of applause, you know, have them slip off, you take a break and you come back and say, wasn't it wonderful? We just heard such an engaging perspective on X. Let's think a little bit about what the perspective on Y might be if we flip it around. So I think that though, if you can sort of get that set ahead of time with having more than one guest, as long as everyone knows ahead of time, they'll have company, that can be really great. And I also think that giving students a little bit of framing, maybe it is in pre-class questions, maybe it is in terms of specific documents that they read, and then really letting them know ahead of time that you will be running or moderating the discussion. You can always sort of step back if the discussion is taking on a reasonable cadence and the class isn't too big, but giving yourself that moderator's privilege from the outset allows you to maintain as much control over the classroom as possible. And if you send somebody maybe going too far in one direction from the audience, uh, the student audience that is, you can redirect. But I know, Mike, you have done a lot of work with remote guests and experts as well. So welcome, welcome your thoughts. And Jessica's yours too, of course. Sure, thank you, Lee. And I think the, the parameters that you set out make a lot of sense. And I would say in the context of an asynchronous guest, so having somebody deliver content in a prepackaged way, I, I ask for the, the transcript in advance. I, I think you have to see what they're going to say, not and, and, and to frame it as, you know, I just want to edit it just to make sure it's the right, you know, because my students are, are not they don't they're not experts right to making sure so you can communicate it in a way that is is not going to turn them off it's going to be basically i want to make sure this isn't going to go over the head of the students but at the same time that provides an opportunity to review the script to make sure that it isn't so one-sided and in the sports betting program we used uh, executives at companies that have a clear interest in certain outcomes and we read the transcripts in advance and in a, most of them were fine but in a couple there were some minor tweet minor suggestions and they're always going to go along with the suggestion they're not going to say no right so it's a way of kind of I think this is always the advantage of asynchronous it's just really being able to be sort of a director 
and editing in advance to prevent some of the issues. I think in a live event, I, I agree with everything Leah said, where it, it, I would just add one thing, you, maybe just the professor talking before the guest speaker talks for five minutes, introducing the topic, it kind of kind of sets the tone that this is a substantive law school class. This isn't a courtroom. No one's winning a case. This isn't a jury. This isn't members of Congress, right? So, so that's another way of kind of setting the tone is to have the professor give a substantive overview that's that talks about different perspectives. Great. So, so I would just add two things. The first is that at least for me, when I was starting out as a law professor, I saw guest speakers as like my easy classes. Whew, right? Like, boy, I've been doing a lot this semester <laughs> and now we have a guest speaker and I'm kind of off the hook. And I had enough bad, badish experiences that I realized I, that I, they actually take more time to work well. And that's because I'm pretty good at integrating what I say with my course objectives, right? I should be there, my course objectives. I'm the one talking, right? It's an easy integration. When you have a guest speaker, like they're not tied into your class. They don't, they're not, a, they can't scaffold as easily as we can. They can't tie in the same vocabulary, the same examples. And so it often can feel like, like a guest speaker is a little bit out, not in left field, but just not as tied in. And it can feel a little random to the students. I think you have to do the prep work on the front end with the speaker to say, here's what I'm hoping we get out of this, right? Here, can we talk through structure, right? I, I think it can often feel uncomfortable because you feel like, oh, they're experts. I'm just gonna let them go. And I think that can be a mistake. Um, the other, the other um, takeaway that I've, I've had is that I think you need to remind your students that the guest speaker will walk away with a view of the law school based on their behavior. Now, again, behavior, I don't mean, like I have an eight-year-old. I don't mean behavior in the same way I talk about it with my eight-year-old. Um, but I mean, if the students are engaged, the guest speaker will walk away thinking, wow, what a great engaged group of students. Maybe we should hire from there, right? Um, I always want our guest speakers to walk away thinking well of our students. And sometimes students need coaching and a reminder that that's one of our goals. So that when I say, does anybody have any questions for our speaker? I don't want to hear silence, right? And I, I remind the students of that. One thing I'll often do to really set that up is I'll ask the students to email me three questions ahead of time. And then I will email back to them. And I'll say, fabulous questions. I especially loved number two. I hope you ask it. Right, because now their question is, like, yeah, we're all scared of asking dumb questions. Now the question's been vetted a little bit, and boy, they're going to ask it. So just thinking about how on both sides we can try to bring together, you know, what we're getting with our expectations for the class. So um, I want to ask if there's any questions for the Q&A, if you want to, if anyone wants to put them in. But um, I do have a, a larger question uh, to the group, which is, um, so uh, there's this well-known phenomenon where any intervention uh, produces good results because people like change and people like thinking, you know, oh, I'm on the cutting edge of something. So and so uh, and then, uh, you know, if you implement it as an overall policy, it stops uh, sort of producing uh, better results. So what tools do you have to identify something that like really was pedagogically successful versus something that was successful because you were kind of happy with doing something new, right? So like, is, have you developed tools for figuring out, you know, which of those is going on? Well, one quick thought, Rebecca, I have always taken advantage of the ability to um, ask students directly, whether it is in office hours or in a more structured way and totally, understanding and respecting that students have their own perspectives and goals. So I may not be getting, <laughs> um, you know, if I'm talking to one person in office hours, I may be getting, you know, their more subjective view, but as much as possible, trying to round out my own sense by getting reflections directly from them, as well as then talking with colleagues. Again, understanding that everyone's classrooms and pedagogical goals and approaches will be different. But if I can sort of thought partner a little bit or, or crowdsource my instinct about whether, you know, I just think remote guest 
speakers are great because I am so happy, especially in the pandemic, to see people as opposed to other people saying, yes, actually, I've been doing this too in a totally different subject area with a much different, you know, size class and it's going well. So I try to kind of gather some data that way, I, a data source to use the term Mike was, or data scout to use Mike's term. <laughs> It's, yeah, I know. And I just would, would add, I totally agree with Leah. I, I think you have to be able to walk away and just accept that everything sunsets at some point. And I mentioned the sports betting program. It, it was super innovative in 2013, uh, 20, 2018. It's not as innovative now. And I think making it smaller, making it more nimble, addressing needs. I think just being honest going into any, anything new is everything has a time. And that time will end at some point. And being excited about the next thing is also important. Just having the attitude of that th these are sort of segments in time, being willing to pivot and being able to accept that some great idea five years ago isn't isn't so great today. And I don't know, I just think that attitude's good in a lot of ways. The only thing I would add is that I think as much as we try to get our students to focus on metacognition and reflect on their own learning, I think sometimes we need to set aside time for ourselves to do that as well. Um, because I think, you know, look, our courses can easily be on autopilot if we let them. I, I try to set aside three afternoons to update a course before I start getting into the details, but literally just setting aside three afternoons in August where I just update the structure of the course. And the idea there is to really have focused time. So it's on my calendar, it's blocked out and it's an appointment. So I know I'm gonna do it. And then to start, the reason I don't just all do it at once is because for me, I need time to kind of ponder on it a little bit. And, and I need time to say, okay, like what, what am I wondering about? Sometimes it can take a while to kill your, an activity you really enjoy. I may not be ready to do that in day one, right? So to kind of say, I'm just going to put it on the table that maybe I don't keep this by, you know, session number two, I'm more willing to kill it. So, you know, just some different ideas on forcing us to go back and reflect on our own, on our own teaching. Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, I, I do a similar thing, although what I try and do is actually like after after class, I come back and I write, to, like if there's something that just didn't work, I write it down. And then when I get to it, you know, when I'm redoing the syllabus, I'm like, okay, I guess I need to change that. Because um, that's when the, the, you know, the memory is the sharpest and most painful that it didn't work. <laughs> Uh, well, I want to thank you guys so much. Um, this was really helpful and I, I loved getting the overview. And I think um, especially with the recording being available, this will be helpful to people who, you know, want to shake loose some things uh, with, uh, with their own teaching. So uh, thank you again for participating. And uh, I hope to see everyone again uh, when we continue the series. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. For, see you all later. Thank you. Thank you.